Sunday, people of Grandview. If you are our guest, uh, maybe you're joining us online or for the very first time, please know that you are especially welcome and we are so glad that you are with us. Obviously, we have returned to a virtual only worship and that's hard. And I want to recognize and just name the same things that our bishop has said in that we know how hard it is to be thinking about um, this week of Thanksgiving and perhaps even on into our Advent and Christmas season uh, about being away apart from one another physically um, and trying to do worship uh, virtually. And uh, I am thankful for uh, the body of believers here who decided that um, the collective good of everyone uh, was more important than our own individual creature comforts. And so I want to name my appreciation for the thoughtfulness and the prayerfulness through which this decision was made and promise you that we are monitoring this on a week-to-week -week basis. And as soon as the trends move in the other direction, it is our intention to move back into a blended hybrid of continuing to offer an online worship experience while reopening our doors to folks who would like to work, worship in person. So we will keep watching and we will move back in that direction as soon as we feel like we can. Right now, we want everyone to remain safe because, um, well, as I said, um, perhaps too starkly, um, I would rather not do any more funerals. So I just want to encourage you all to take all the precautions you can personally to remain safe during this, stock, during this time and know that this is still a body of Christ. And if you need and um, you need something from this family, that we are here and uh, we will look to serve you in every and any way that we possibly can. So um, with that, I want to say welcome because this is a special Sunday. We're blending two services. We have both Thanksgiving uh, this week, and, and um, instead of having a specific Thanksgiving worship experience, we're blending that also with Sunday service, which also happens to be Christ the King Sunday. So you'll hear in our music and in our liturgy this morning, we'll have some blending of different themes. We're both giving thanks for all that we have, as well as we are naming Christ as our King, our risen Savior, and our Lord. So welcome to worship. We are so glad you're here. Please join us in the call to worship. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Blessing and honor and glory and might be unto the Lamb. Worthy is Christ who has ransomed us by his blood from every tribe and tongue and nation and made his people a kingdom and priests to our God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, almighty who was and is and is to come. Amen. Please join me in our opening prayer. New every morning is your love. Great God of light and all day long, you are working for, it, for good in the world. Stir up in us desire to serve you, to live peacefully with our neighbors, and to devote each of each day to your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. <laughs>
For this morning is Matthew verses 25, 31 through 36. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly, I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, You are accursed. Depart from me into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me, give me clothing. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into inter eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Friends, would you join me now in an attitude of prayer? Creator God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of each of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For you, God, are our rock and our strength and our redeemer. Amen. People of Grandview, we live in an age of fierce individualism. Especially, I should note, as Americans, we see the value in the individual, grit and reaching for the American dream. Those are, those are great ideals for us, right? Now, on some level, I know that this wasn't always the case, but I'd never really taken the time to try to understand where or when this individualistic streak came into our society or where it came from or what the purpose was. 
And then the pandemic came along, and, well, I found myself a little bit baffled, frankly. Baffled about the sense of self, self-autonomy, which really superseded any sense of the greater good of the whole or doing things for others. So, as I often do when I don't understand something, I turn to scholars who have spent their lifetime studying such things in an effort to glean just a minute fragment of their knowledge. I came across a book called Good Society by sociologist Robert Bella, which he actually wrote in 1991. And while it's nearly 30 years old, the, the text as a whole is a masterful work, and, and I would encourage you, if you have a desire, to, uh, to, to seek it out and read it for yourself. However, for this morning's purpose, I just wanted to try to give a summary of, of what I found therein and, and then found a beautifully composed review of it from uh, the Santa Clara University Marucla Center of Applied Ethics, which is uh, in the Jesuit University at Santa Clara, California. In a paper titled, Creating the Good Society, I'd like to share a portion of that paper, which is a a great review of the book overall, with you this morning. So here's what the authors write. In The Good Society, sociologist Robert Bella and his co-authors challenge Americans to take a good look at themselves. Faced with growing homelessness, rising unemployment, crumbling highways, and impending ecological disaster, our response is one of apathy, frustration, cynicism, and retreat into our private worlds. The social problems confronting us today, the authors argue, are largely the result of failures of our institutions. And our response largely result of our failure to realize the degree to which our lives are shaped by institutional forces and the degree to which we, as a democratic society, can shape these forces for the better. What prevents Americans from taking charge, the author argues, is according, well, is a long and abiding allegiance to individualism. The belief that the good society is one on which individuals are left free to pursue their private satisfactions independently of others. A pattern of thinking that emphasizes individual achievement and its self-fulfillment. As the author points out, this way of thinking about ourselves and our society can be traced back to our country's 18th century founders, most notably John Locke. Locke's teaching was one of the most powerful ideologies ever invented, if not the most powerful. It promised an unheard of degree of individual freedom and an ultimate unlimited opportunity to compete for material well-being and an unprecedented limitation on the arbitrary powers of government to interfere with individual initiative. Our nation's founders, however, assumed that the freedom of individuals to pursue their own ends would be tempered by a public spirit, so to speak, and a concern for the common good that would shape our social institutions. The Lockean ideal of the autonomous individual was, in the 18th century, embedded in a complex moral ecology that included family and church on the one hand, and on the other hand, a vigorous public sphere in which economic initiative was hoped, it hoped, was grew together with public spirit. See, the 18th century idea of public was a decursive community capable of thinking about the public good. It is this, it is precisely this sense of common purpose and public spirit crucial to the guidance of institutions in a democracy that is absent from our society today. A ruthless individualism, expressed primarily through a market mentality, has invaded every sphere of our lives, undermining those institutions such as the family, the university, the church, that have traditionally functioned as foci of collective purposes, history, and culture. 
The lack of common purpose and concern for the common good bodes ill for a people claiming to be a democracy. Caught up in our private pursuits, we allow the workings of our major institutions, the economy and the government, to go on sort of over our heads. One way of summing up the difficulty Americans have in understanding the fundamental roots of their problems is to say that they still have a Lockean political culture emphasizing individual freedom and the pursuit of individual affluence, which we've sort of rebranded as the American dream, and having that in a society with a most unlockian economy and government. We have the illusion that we can control our fate because individual economic opportunity is indeed considerable, especially if one starts with middle class advantages, and our political life is formally free. Yet, powerful forces affecting the lives of all of us are not operating under the norm of democratic consent. In particular, the private governments of great corporations make decisions on the base of their own advantage, not of the public good. The federal government has enormously increased its power, especially in the form of the military-industrial complex, in ways that are almost invulnerable to citizen knowledge, much less control, on the grounds of national defense. The private rewards and the formal freedoms have obscured us from how much we have lost in genuine democratic control of the society we live in. Friends, this, these are incredibly convicting words. And while this book was written nearly 30 years ago, I think it's easily argued that we are even more fiercely individualistic today. And so perhaps that's why the story in the Gospel of Matthew rang with such convicting words for me today. See, this familiar passage about the separating of the sheep from the goats and whoever does this to the least of these gets widely interpreted through a lens of individual freedom and individual responsibility, right? And before I go on, let me just pause and say, yes, I affirm that we do, in fact, have a personal and individual mandate to help the poor, to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, quench the thirst of the thirsty, visit the sick and imprisoned, and last but not least, welcome the stranger. However, that is not what Jesus was addressing here. This whole section of Matthew was Jesus' final call out of the nation of Israel. See, he had just finished his diatribe against the temple and especially the scribes and the Pharisees and has now turned his judgment against the nation. Here again from the 31st and 32nd verses where he says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates sheep from the goats. Friends, that means that when Jesus returns to judge the quick and the dead, that the way we behave collectively will determine at very least in part how we are judged individually. So, let's just... Uh, Take a moment and let's check on our scorecard. How are we doing collectively? So Jesus said, for I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. Well, I mean, we, we have food pantries and we do that work, especially as the church. But we all know that we have people who go to bed every night in this country hungry and thirsty in our own nation, never mind in all of God's creation. I don't really think we necessarily get a glowing review there. Well, let's keep going. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. Well, if we see what a mess we've made of our immigration policies, I wouldn't exactly say we are welcoming people with open arms, but that's complicated, right? It, it isn't something that I can fix. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. 
Well, unless you don't have work, then, then you just aren't trying hard enough. I mean, why should I pay for your clothes? I go to work, and why should my taxes go to helping someone who, who won't even go get a job? And, and sure, we, we have the greatest health system in the world, right? I mean, there is no place you can get better quality of care than right here in the good old U.S. of A, unless you don't have insurance. And in that case, in the United States, you have a 25% higher mortality rate than your insured counterpart with similar health. But I have insurance, so I don't need to worry about that. I was in prison and you visited me. Aha! So, now, we do have great prisons in this country, don't we? We have them both ran by the government. We have them ran by private corporations. In fact, by population, we incarcerate more people per capita than any other nation in the world. Did you know that? 665 out of every 100,000 people in the United States are in jail. See, we do it real well. In fact, that puts us at number one in the world for incarceration per capita. El, El Salvador comes in a measly second with only nine, 590 per 100,000, nothing compared to our 665. And we're leaps and bounds ahead of places like Venezuela, which only have 178 per 100,000, or China with a measly 120 per 100,000, or even the bastion of freedom that is Iran, who has 294 per 100,000 imprisoned. No, we, we do it far better, 665. Now, as far as visiting them or helping them, well, that's just not safe in most cases, right? I mean, you know what those kind of people are like. There's a reason that we keep them separated from civil society. People of Grandview, whether we want to believe it or not, Jesus said it plain as day that when he returns, the sheep and the goats will be separated. And as I look at the scorecard, at least the scorecard that Jesus talked specifically about, I'm feeling a bit goat-like. If we hope to change that, though, well, I think Mr. Bella had some good advice in his book. He said, in a world of increasing complexity and independence, we can no longer afford to go our own way. Rather, we need to ex exercise our capacity for developing institutions that recognize our interconnectedness, moving toward the creation of the good society, where the common good is the pursuit of the good in common. So let us pursue that common good in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My friends, we come to the time in worship where we normally pause to say our common confession, and we're going to do that. But this week, uh, I just decided it was a good week to try a different piece of liturgy for that. So um, this will be a responsive reading. Uh, and when I pause, and I'll say it along with you, but the response will be, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Merciful God, we confess that the circle of love is repeatedly broken because of our sin of exclusion. We create separate circles, the inner circle and the outer circle, the circle of power and the circle of despair, the circle of privilege and the circle of deprivation. Forgive us our sins as we forgive all who have sinned against us. We confess that the circle of love is broken Whenever there is alienation, whenever there is misunderstanding, whenever there is insensitivity or a hardening of the heart. Forgive us our sins as we forgive all who have sinned against us. We confess that the circle of love is broken. Whenever we cannot see eye to eye, whenever we cannot link hand to hand, 
whenever we cannot live heart to heart and affirm our differences. Forgive us our sins as we forgive all who have sinned against us. Through God's grace, we are forgiven by the mercy of our Creator, through the love of the Christ, and in the power of the Spirit. Let us rejoice and be glad. Glory to God. Amen. Friends, this is the point in our worship when we pause and we reflect on what God has spoken to us and how we want to respond to God's words. So as we have and we continue to have, we have the opportunity at umcgrandview.com where you can go and make a gift online if that works for you. Or of course you can respond by sending your gifts in through the mail as you have. And in this season of generosity and thanksgiving, my heart is in saying thank you. Thank you for the generousness that you have shown, the fact that we are one of the very few bodies of believers who is still doing financially just exactly what we thought we would be doing uh, at this time of the year, even through the difficulty of separation and not being able to gather together. I cannot express how grateful I am for your faithfulness to that and um, would just encourage you uh, to, to continue in those ways as we move through this season of generosity and thanksgiving. Thank you so much. Friends, would you join me in our pastoral prayer? Almighty Creator, God our Father and our Mother, Lord, we come to you today, this day of thanksgiving and this day in which we recognize your Son, Jesus Christ, is our King. That Christ sits at the hand of the Father, that Christ gave himself for us. And that there are no trials, no tribulations which we may face that Jesus did not face when he walked among us. Lord, let us proclaim Christ as our King. Let us give thanks heartily for all of the blessings that we have. And let us share in bounty the ways that you would call us to share and to serve one another. And let us do it all in the name of Jesus Christ, the one who taught us how to pray by saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, as I always reflect, the time goes too quickly, and I hope it has been a blessing for you. Here now, this blessing, which is actually a prayer of St. Thomas Aquinas. Give us, O Lord, steadfast hearts, which no unworthy thought can drag downward, unconquered hearts, which no tribulation can wear out, upright hearts, which no unworthy purpose may tempt aside. Bestow upon us also, O Lord our God, understanding to know you, diligence to seek you, wisdom to find you, and a faithfulness that may finally embrace you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <laughs>